Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, almost didn't get that out. It kind of squeaked out. Hope you got your Bibles. Hope you got your journals. Hope you got your coffee. Whatever it else is that you would like or you would like to have to drink or whatever, join us and let's uh, launch in. Good, <coughs> good morning. I almost got to, I'm squeaking. I think my voice is changing. Good morning. Miss Cynthia, Dale, and Ryan. Popped up their very first thing, then Miss Gloria out on the coast. God bless you, girl. It's good to see you, Miss Carolyn. Great to see you yesterday. And there's Miss Pam, and uh, we'll just uh, keep uh, watching as others come on and we get together. Uh, what a great day. It is a wonderful day. The sun is at its apex, is risen over. Good morning, buddy and Julia. Yes, and Miss Ruth. High in the sky. Now, understand Understand what some of you are saying. Carolyn's going, in what world are you in? I understand that. But up over the clouds that have covered the rest of our world here, there is a sun high in the sky shining brightly. Okay? We know that. We understand that. We believe that. Okay? So, with that out of the way, and there is Miss Terry on this morning. Uh, so, good. Everybody's starting to, to come on and wake up, and I hope you're bright-eyed and ready to go as we join. Thank you for yesterday. Wonderful time of worship. Thank you for being a part. All of you that were in-house, all of you that were still online, so good. So wonderful and good. It was neat to hear from uh, DD today. Told him we missed him. Like to see, uh, you know, be anxious to see them when they come back. Get them involved again. What a great and wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, I've just had a great weekend, so uh, I appreciate so much all the multiple, multiple well wishes that we have gotten from people, cards and notes and everything. Uh, you know, for our anniversary, it was very, very special. I go back and I'm reading them, and uh, it uh, it's just a joy. Heard from friends that uh, uh, that we've seen, uh, Jerry and Becky, who Jerry was my music guy uh, in in Denver when we passed in Brookfield for a number of years, and uh, you know, heard from them. It's just such a blessing. What a, you know, I I have to tell you, there's some things about social media I don't like, but there are some things that are absolutely wonderful and beautiful and Miss Sue just came in and this is one of those things that is beautiful about the social media that we are able to do what we are doing this morning. Well, I want us to move right in because we've got a lot of territory to cover so I don't want to uh, waste everybody's time by uh, blathering on but I'd rather get into the word. Uh, what we began to look at last week is that uh, uh, just a, an emphasis on the fact that since the early days of the church, Satan has actively opposed the truth of the Word of God. In fact, before the church, from the very beginning of time, uh, you know, remember, you know, one of the first doubts that he threw out, threw out there that captured the mind of a person was Eve, when he said, "Did God really say this?" I mean, you know, think about it. Did He really say this? And then he began to subtly begin to twist the words of God. Uh, but this is especially to it regard to the gospel. Repeatedly, he has raised up false teachers within the church in an attempt to deceive uh, the people of God or people that, that are being drawn in you know, to uh, a relationship with God. You remember that the Apostle Paul warned the Ephesian elders uh, that from among their own selves men would arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And my sweetie just popped on, and uh, so I get to say good morning to her again. Uh, so a major theme throughout the entire word, but especially do we see it centered in the New Testament, uh, including this epistle that we're, we're, we're studying now, is that God's people need to develop a sense of discernment so that they can avoid sp uh, a spiritual deception. We need to just be discerning about what is taught and, and people are taught. I would expect that of you in regards to me and what I teach. I want you to search out what I teach. I want you to be discerning. I want to make sure I'm right. And I want to make sure that, you know, I, I used to, I, I've told people for a long time 
that listen, if you you know you know, you come down on the side of the word, and I come down on the side of the word, we're going to be together, you know, in this thing. Now, last week, uh, you know, on Thursday and Friday, we began this critical section. Uh, we saw that to avoid spiritual deception, we need to be a discerning people. Satan works in the realm of religion. He uses Bible, he uses Christian terms, he uses uh, church structures to, in order to, to, to weave his, his uh, web of deception. We should be aware of those who, uh, who leave to form new groups with, with new theology. We talked about that. Uh, or anyone who is offering a new truth that others have missed over the centuries, or they have this special revelation that nobody else has. Also, we need to be discerning of the doctrines of the Word of God. Sound doctrine really does matter because it's inextricably linked to the personal relationship that we have with God. Also, sound doctrine about the person and the work of Jesus Christ is vital because Satan is, is especially going to hit in this area and undermine the person and, and the work of Jesus Christ. We find that uh, every cult that rises up from within the church, they focus on the validity of the Word of God. They usually begin changing it and twisting it and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. They will say, yes, we believe in God, but this Jesus thing, he was a good moral teacher, he was all of these, but he wasn't God. He wasn't divine. He was a man. He may have had the God spirit on him for a period of time, but he wasn't God. So we need to learn to discern even the subtlest twist within our, our doctrines, within our teaching, especially where it concerns the word and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come together with your word open and allow you, Lord, to speak to our heart. We want to glean out of your word the precious nuggets and truths that are there, that, Lord, uh, as we glean that field, we might have a basket full of rich, rich things that you have given us. We want to hear from you. Certainly, we don't need to hear the ramblings of any man. We do need, though, to hear uh, the deep utterance of the Spirit of God, your Spirit bearing witness within our spirits that we are the children of God, and you opening up to us the understanding and the mind of God. Lord, you know, your Spirit knows what is in the heart and the mind of God and you have put him within us to reveal those things to our lives. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, as we continue forth in this study. We pray that you will lead and guide our, our thoughts and our, and our teaching, and even later on, the discussions that might rise. To you be glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in uh, this last part of uh, 1 John chapter 2 in verses 24 through 27, the apostle continues with the theme of how to avoid deception. He shows us how to develop a discernment that we need to persevere in faith. And one of the first things that he tells us here is that we need to develop discernment by abiding in the word, especially in, as, as it regards the truth of the gospel. In Oh, i sorry, I forgot I had that cell in there. Well, I'll have that updated by tomorrow. I'll have a new figure from Janice. All right. Uh, there we are. All right. Uh, we need to develop discernment by abiding in the Word, especially with regards to the Gospel. All right. John, second, uh, second John, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Look at those with me. You might be able to read it better in your own than on the screen, but it's there. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Now, when John makes reference to what you have heard from the beginning, he's referring to the teaching of the apostles, especially their teaching on the core issue of the gospel. 
John begins this letter with the words, what was from the beginning. Now, when he says that, he's referring uh, to Jesus Christ himself. Now, when you begin to take in the very person and work of Jesus Christ, you see, that's embodied in the gospel, is it not? He came to do what? Seek and to save those which are lost, to give his life a ransom for many. In Jude chapter 3, or verse 3 in Jude, uh, he makes pretty much the same kind of, of, of statement. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you, uh, to appeal, uh, write you appealing that you will contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now, sometimes the word faith is used for that sense of trust that we have in Christ, and other times, as here in Jude's writing, uh, it's used for the truths that we believe about the one we trust. In other words, it is that body of truth or that truthful teaching, truthful doctrine concerning our faith, particularly as it relates to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, which is what? embodied in the gospel. Now, you hear that repeated, but it, it, it's repeated for emphasis, for a reason, and I'm doing that for, for a very good reason, because the gospel is something that is, is consistently and constantly under attack by the adversary through false teachers. When John tells us to abide in what we heard from the beginning, he means that we're to stay faithful and true to what the apostles had taught. Remember, primarily this letter is going to Ephesian or the Ephesian believers that John has been pastoring, but that Ephesian church started under the leadership of who? That's right, under Paul. So they had at its very foundation the teaching of the apostle Paul. Peter has been through, Apollos has been through. Now, Apollos wasn't an apostle, but he was he he taught those 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 same truths. John now is there, so they have been built and nurtured and grown up on the teaching of the apostles. So, if, or since, they began with the gospel as taught by Jesus to the apostles, and then passed on to them, and uh, with all the other sound teachings, uh, uh, doctrines of the apostles, then they're to abide in them, since their teaching is foundational to the church, as Paul points out in Ephesians 2 in his letter to this church. Listen in verses 19 through 22. So then, you are no longer strangers or aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into all the temple in the Lord in whom you also are being fit or built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Now that smacks a little bit of yesterday's message doesn't it? And it should because of course this is one of those other places that that chief cornerstone Jesus re is referred to as the cornerstone when Paul says that we have been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets he's not talking about people and personalities remember when Paul writes Corinth he 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 dismisses that when he says well you, some of you are saying you're of Apollos some of Paul well who is Apollos and who is Paul but only those you know who from whom you heard. No, he's not talking about personalities and people. He's talking about what they taught. Since what they taught was in alignment to the cornerstone, or Jesus Christ, and what he, and what he taught them, they're saying basically, why depart from these sure truths? for simple religious speculation of those false teachers. In other words, we have the apostles' teaching in the New Testament. We have the teachings of Jesus Christ as taught to them, and they teaching throughout their letters. We have all of this, 
John is telling us to abide in these certainties and not be drawn away by mere speculation and, 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 and foolish ramblings of men. John makes four points about the gospel here. You know, and then we draw a couple of conclusions from that. Uh, we'll see how far we get today. The first point that he makes is the gospel comes to us only through God's word. False teachers were claiming that they have a special revelation apart from the word. But their revelations were subjective philosophical nonsense. By way of contrast, the apostles had been with Jesus Christ. They had heard his teachings. They had seen his miracles. They even would spent time with him after he raised from the dead, having been a witness of that. They knew that the old, entire Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. Remember what Luke writes in his gospel at the end of that gospel, in the 24th chapter. He says, and starting in verse 44, he says, now, he said to them, these are my words which I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Well, you can look at, uh, again in Luke and see, remember when he was on the Emmaus Road and he was walking with these uh, men on the Emmaus Road. And they're, they're telling him, they're downcast, but they're telling him everything that happened in Jerusalem. And, and, and he opened to them the scriptures and explained Jesus to them. And after he departed, they looked at each other and said, did our heart not burn as he spoke? You see, he spent that time teaching them and, and showing them how all of scripture pointed to him and, 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 and was about him. He fulfilled all of its prophecies and all of its laws. Even Paul, who had not been part of the Twelve, had a personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and said that he received the gospel that he preached directly from Jesus. In fact, Galatians 1 and verses 11 and 12 says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you how subtly uh, false teachers love to twist and pervert. There's a, there's a stream of theology coming out today speaking about the new theology of Paul. And it's talking about Pauline theology being different than John's theology, Pauline doctrine being different than John and Peter and James and all of them because he had this special teaching that was given for him to take to the Gentiles. You see how subtle the enemy can be. But when you do a firm study of Scripture, you find that what, what Paul taught is no different than what James taught or what, what John taught or what Peter taught or what Jude, who was not an apostle, but Jude, the, the brother of Christ, taught. Remember back when we started our study, John opens his letter with his qualifications to write about these matters, qualifications that the false teachers didn't have. And we've already pulled out several places where John and, and Paul are absolutely on the same page. What does John say? What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, looked at, touched with our heads concerning the word of life. And life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. What we have seen and heard, we then proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things I write that our joy might be made complete. In other words, if, if, if you're in fellowship with, with us, with John and Peter and Paul, all of them, you're having fellowship with the Father too because our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. You see, they were in Christ. Christ was in them. That's exactly what 
Paul says as well. The point is, the gospel is not the result of philosophic speculations or mysterious revelations. It is the witness of Jesus Christ himself written in the New Testament by men who had seen the risen Lord and heard from his own lips these truths. You cannot learn the gospel by going out into nature and having some mystical aesthetic experience. Now, yes, you can see God's glory reflected there, but you're not going to learn the gospel. You can't attain a knowledge of the gospel through philosophy or logic or endless philosophic speculations and the traditions of man. But you can learn the truth. You can learn the gospel and all of it in the Word of God. It tells us about Jesus Christ. One of the most succinct statements in all of the gospel is still an old favorite and an old familiar, is it not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. Any deviance from the truth of the gospel is hearsay. It is spiritual deception, deception, and it's coming straight from Satan himself. You might feel that's an awfully strong statement. Maybe it is strong language. And it's extremely dogmatic. And it won't fly in a postmodern culture. And people might be right when they say that. But then that doesn't make it any less truth. And it's exactly what this postmodern culture needs to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. The plain truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the gospel, secondly, John is going to tell us, introduces you to a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Uh, fat fingers this morning, I guess. In... 1 John 2 and the last part of verse 24, John states, If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. The gospel is not only a set of doctrines to agree with, but a personal relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. John said, in, in uh, recounting the intercessory prayer of Jesus, that great high priestly prayer in John 17. Verse 3 says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Well, he also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If a person is not trusted personally in Jesus Christ to forgive their sins and give them eternal life, then they don't understand the first thing about the gospel. If they say, well, yeah, but I've worked hard. I've knocked on, you know, a hundred doors in two weeks. Or I've passed out flyers and, and, and tracts. Or I've, uh, you know, gone to confession or whatever it might be and they're putting their hope and their trust in that, they don't know the first thing about the gospel. The Apostle Paul was a devout Jew, fastidiously keeping all of the rituals and the rules of the Jewish faith, but he didn't have a clue about eternal life. And he didn't know God personally any more than Nicodemus did when he came to visit Jesus at night and found out that uh, all of his credentials meant nothing but that he had to be born again. After his conversion, after his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road, he wrote that he counted that all that previous stuff that he had, all of his past experiences lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing intimately, personally, Jesus Christ as Lord. If you have friends or loved ones who do not know Christ personally, don't let them settle for mere religion. Ask God to open their eyes so that they will come in to the family of God and abide in the Son and in the Father. Now, the third point that John makes here is that the gospel centers on God's promise of eternal life. 
in the 25th verse, he writes, this is the promise which he himself made us, eternal life. That's a promise he's made us. That's the culmination of promise of the great gospel message is eternal life. Abundant life, life with him for eternity, now and forever. What could be greater? Apart from the gospel, we are under God's righteous condemnation because of our sins. He said, Jesus said to the world, not to condemn the world, but by, by him the world might be saved. If we believe, we're not condemned. But if we don't believe, we are already or still, we remain under condemnation. Apart from the gospel, that's where we, we are. Why? Because of our sin. And we all face death. And after death, the writer of Hebrews says we face judgment. Now the good news of the gospel is that God did not come to us to say, here, here's some rules and rituals that you need to keep for uh, all your life. And then if you don't commit a mortal sin, then you do good deeds and those outweigh your bad deeds. And, and then, and then uh, you have enough relatives pray for you when you die. You just might get into heaven. No, that's another theology. That's another doctrine. That's another belief system. He doesn't come and say, here, take these and walk down the street knocking on doors and, 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 may, and the more you pass out, the more, more uh, stripes you get, the more marks on the positive side you get. No, that's another religion. That's another faith. It's not the gospel. It's not the good news. The good news is that God himself promised us eternal life. So why turn to anything else? The fact that eternal life is God's promise means that it's not something that we have to work for or, as a matter of fact, deserve. You see this all through the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry. When they let the paralytic down through the roof on a stretcher in front of Jesus, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. What, what, what had that man done that deserved it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was a free gift. When the notoriously sinful woman wet Jesus' feet with her tears and anointed them with perfume, when, when, when uh, even though her sins had been many, Jesus said, your sins have been forgiven. And he forgave them all. What did she have to do? Was it the washing of his feet? No. He was seeing into the heart of belief. The worship she was rendering him was a result of the forgiveness she'd received. Or with a guilty thief. By the way, when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, that's past tense, they've been forgiven. I forgave you. Which is another indication of why she was pouring out such lavish worship. With a guilty thief on the cross next to Jesus said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus responded, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What did he have to do? He couldn't come down off the cross to, uh, to, 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 to go to a confessional or hand out tracts or anything else. He could do nothing except believe and throw himself upon the mercy of Christ and trust him. What could be greater news than that Jesus promises eternal life as a free gift to any guilty sinner who receive Christ and his gospel by faith? Since God promises eternal life apart from works, then why turn to a system of religious bondage that cannot deliver either forgiveness or eternal life? even after a lifetime of striving for it. Apart from spiritual blindness and pride that wants to take credit for salvation, there is no other way of explaining why people turn to false religions to save them. The gospel alone proclaims in Romans 5 and verse 4, but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. I have just enough time to finish the last point that John makes here. Satan relentlessly promotes confusion about the gospel. 
Look again here at verse 26. These things I have written you, written you, written you, written you to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As I said last week, from the earliest days while the apostles were still living, the enemy was sowing confusion in the churches about the gospel. In his last letter to young Timothy, well, maybe not so young at that point, probably in his 40s, Paul warned Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, he says, But evil men and apostles will proceed from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. Then he exhorts young Timothy here when he says, You, however, continue. I highlight that, that in yellow. This is the same word that John translates as abide. Continue, abide in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The exhortation of both Paul and John is to continue to abide in the word which is able to bring us to salvation and then able to keep growing us in our salvation experience. Because remember, salvation is, is a threefold manifestation. It is, it is initially our, our justification where we are made righteous in Christ. Our sins are forgiven. The penalty of our sin is paid for. We die to sin, but it is an ongoing process of sanctification whereby God is constantly delivering us from the, the power and the influence of the old man. And one day salvation will be complete in its completed sense in our exaltation when we are together with him face to face. If Satan can cause confusion about the gospel, everything else is affected. It's a domino that when pushed, all the other ones begin to fall. If we err here at the doctrine of salvation, we will err in every other doctrine. Take the doctrine of the word. If it's not truthful because it calls us to turn from sin and believe in, in, in Jesus Christ, as the only propitiation for our sin, as the only way to the Father. If it's not truthful, then it's, then, then i got to tell you, there's no need for us to repent. There's no need for us to truth, because he is not the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. You see, if this doctrine of salvation is wrong, then we question the entirety of the word of God. What about the doctrine of man? Well, then man is not as sinful as man seems to be. We're not as deprived as the word says we are. And above all, we're not separated from God. We only have a problem that a little ritual or a little hard work can fix. If the doctrine of salvation isn't as we understand it, then the doctrine of God is wrong. That domino is going to fall because God is not holy and separate from all sin. In fact, if the gospel is incorrect, then God would be a monster demanding the death of his son or the death of anything for minor problems. Only God is a permissive grandfather type who winks and looks the other way at the misdeeds of his precocious little one. That is, if the gospel is wrong. If the doctrine of the gospel is wrong, then the doctrine of Christ is, is, it falls. That, that, that domino is going to tumble. We'll not need Jesus to be our Savior, to be our propitiation, to be the satisfaction for, for our sin, to deliver us from our sin, to pay the price that we cannot pay, since uh, we will be able to pay the price ourselves. He is not God, rather he's a charlatan, a fraud. If the doctrine of the gospel is wrong, 
If the gospel is wrong, then the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, that domino is going to fall. If we err at the doctrine of salvation, we're going to err when it comes to the Holy Spirit because we won't need the Holy Spirit to convince us and convict us of sin and judgment and righteousness. If the doctrine of salvation is wrong. And on and on we go. When we err at the doctrine of salvation, it'll all fall apart. Pull at that string and the whole fabric, the whole cloth unravels. This is why the enemy is constantly on the attack, trying to divert people away from the word given to us from the very beginning. But I would tell you, that these basic to die on the hill doctrines that we hold precious. They are so interwoven together that to attack one is to attack them all. To twist one will end up twisting every one of them. To tip one domino will make all the rest of them fall. That's part of the beauty of it. Because it's stable, unchangeable, woven into an unterrible fabric that holds our life together. Take heed. When you hear something that doesn't sound quite right, search it out. Get to the bottom of it. That's John's admonition to us. That's Paul's. Study to show yourself approved a workman who needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, I thank you so much for these moments we spend together, may you in all your glory and power reveal yourself to our hearts. And may we see areas, Lord, that need to be cleaned up or cleaned out or readjusted. May we live our life to you. Let us hear your teaching, your reproof, your correction, your training. Let us submit to you as our absolute sovereign authority. Lord, this day you've given us, and I pray that you have filled us up and that our cup will remain filled and overflowing, that, Father, we may be used of you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you all. We love you, and I pray that your cup is full, and I pray that it continues to fill up and overflow. As I've said before, let's splash out on other people the grace and the glory of God. And I'll see you in the morning. We'll pick up here and move on forward. God bless you all.